don't you just stand and uh, join us in the praise team? If you'd bow your heads as you do, Father, we ask your blessing as we sing to you. You, for whatever reason, you tell us to sing songs to you. You like that. You want that of us. So, Lord, as we uh, as we bring a sacrifice of praise to you in accordance with your wishes, Lord, we ask your multiplication upon it and uh, that the, the heavenly hosts would uh, would just join in with us in Jesus name. Amen. Amen.
Lord, you are worthy of our praise.
Jesus, that you have come. We just say yes. Hallelujah to your coming. Even in a greater way, in a greater measure, may we receive everything that you have to come to bring us in this season. In Jesus' name, amen. It is so good to be in person, isn't it? It's just not the same. It's just not the same thing. And um, the reason the, uh, the screens aren't down and um, you'll want to grab a Bible, we're pretty sure the COVID got our computer. <laughs> and I, I didn't know that viruses were, worked like that. <laughs> but we're working on it. We're going gonna to get that fixed. I'll tell you, the tech team's been having just the, the greatest time ever since COVID began. They're just having a ball. <laughs> <laughs> They're just having a ball with everything, aren't you guys? You can tell by that belly laugh we got back there. <laughs> uh, and so don't forget them. God bless the tech team. <laughs> Thank God for you. Um, uh, we should lay hands on the computers and, and the tech team people. And <laughs> um, It is on my heart. Um, what was the scripture when we were worshiping? Well, you know, let me start with this. This morning during our pr time of prayer before the service, um, there was sort of, I'm going to call it a prophetic word, but there was a word um, from the scriptures where in Galilee, um, he could not do many miracles there because, because they had unbelief. And I was just feeling so convicted as that was being prayed, oh Lord, let that not be us. And and I'm, th I'm thinking of this, this is coming into my heart, coming into my head during worship, and I'm thinking, I feel like there's something we're supposed to do this morning. There are people that are still sick with COVID in our community, and the other thing that's come to my awareness, this wire is driving me nuts, another thing that's come to my awareness is, um, is I didn't realize there were such lingering effects. We've got a lot of COVID-recovered people, and yet they're still... They're still lingering through like headaches and lack of taste and it seems like it's just individual to everybody. So I'm just going to ask, can you all, let's all join together in a faith and let's, let's pray over, uh, three things are on my heart, let's pray over protection from those who have not had it yet and shoot, as long as we're doing this, protection over every kind of flu and every kind of sickness this season. How about that? We'll do that. And the second thing is let's pray for those who have it. Um, and if you know someone, and let's do this, if you want to stand in the gap, um, you know, you can do that. You can stand for someone. You can go into the courts and say, I'm receiving this for them. Then just open your hands in your laps if you're standing for someone that you know has it. And then, and then if you are someone that you, you can either stand in the gap for someone who's recovering, recovered, but they're in those lingering symptoms, or if you are one of those that has those lingering s symptoms, I just feel moved to, um, to have a real prayer of faith where we're going to go into the courts right now and we're going to say the lingering symptoms have to stop now that there's going to be quick recovery and those are going to end. Do we, we believe he wants to do this? I think he wants to do this. Okay, so, so just if you're standing for yourself or for someone else, just open your hands in your lap because we're going to receive this in faith. We're not going to be like Galilee. Okay, Father, we, uh, we thank you. Jesus, I thank you for um, coming <laughs> on that first Christmas for making that, that sacrifice we're going to talk about today. And, I, and we thank you for what you accomplished, that you took on stripes, that you, you were whipped and your, your blood flowed so that healing would be available for us. You conquered sickness and death. We declare our faith. And right now, in the name of Jesus, first of all, I am asking protection on this body and our families and those that we stand in the courts for right now, Lord. We're asking for protection from every kind. Sure, COVID, Lord, we're asking there will be no COVID. Will you, will you protect us from that? But every other, every kind of flu, every kind of cough, every kind of sickness, we're asking for a kingdom health. There is no sickness in your kingdom. And secondly, Lord, for all those that, that, are, in, that are in the throes of COVID now, we're asking for, for uh, supernatural recovery 
from your courts. Lord, will you touch their bodies, great physician, and make it stop in the authority of your name. And finally, Lord, we're just, we're just going to draw the line now on these lingering symptoms. I just want to ask in the name of Jesus, Lord, taste and smell is returning to people. We're asking that no good gift, all the pleasures that you've given us to glorify you on, they no longer get to be stolen in the name of Jesus. Headaches are stopping. Body aches in the name of Jesus. We're, we're asking in a faith that your heart, the heart of a good father, wants to do this. Thank you, Jesus. And if you agree... Amen. Okay. <laughs> what do I got here? Okay. <laughs> and I'm just going to pray again. Lord, we ask your blessing on this. I ask that in this time that we're gathered in your presence in person, that you would increase our, our capacity to love you that you would increase um, the, si the space <laughs> that we have, our ability to be thankful for what you've done, even right now as we're gathered, Lord. Amen. Amen. So uh, let's talk about Christmas. Y'all ready for Christmas? <laughs> um, you know, I just want to start, I just want to start here. Christmas, we all know the story, and I probably shouldn't say that. We probably have viewers and listeners out there, and, and but most of us are, are pretty, um, pretty well-versed in the story of Christmas, a narrative that happened at like a moment in time, right? Like it actually happened. It's historically recorded, and that is something. In fact, that's, let's never minimize that. But here's what's on my heart to get us started. Um. You know, the key to understanding all spiritual things is understanding um, that our Father, that God is eternal, okay? Now, um, now, when we say that, let's put a fine point on this. The, the Hebrew people, they, they didn't say, they didn't think like we commonly believe in our culture. They didn't think like um, God had the power of eternity, and he wanted to invite us into that. Like he could offer us this thing, eternity, <laughs> and, and give it to us. The, the way they thought was God is eternity, right? And so how does that connect to the Christmas story? Here, here's what I want to say. While it is a narrative, a point in time, what I want to look at just to get us started is that it is also, it is the revelation of the Father's heart. The narrative the narrative that happened at a moment in time is the revelation of the Father's heart. Even Jesus said of his own ministry, he said he tells us explicitly why he came. And, you know, you might be thinking, well, he came so that he could go to the cross and, and to, re to buy the redemption of the world, and you'd be right. But at, at points in the Gospels, he said specifically of himself, this is why I came. And then you know what he said? He said it's to reveal the Father. So now listen, the Christmas story, what the Christmas story is, is the revelation of the Father. Now, it happened at a point in time. So what? There are details of that story. Um, we remember things like um, the angel Gabriel appeared to Mary. And what? He announced impossible things, not just things. He said, he said you're blessed among all women. Through you, um, impossible th kingdom things are going to happen. Um, we, remember, we remember a road trip at the most inconvenient time. I mean, seriously, we might as well relate with this. They had to go, when she was very, very pregnant, about to pop, they have to go on a road trip on a donkey, right? And we remember things like this. In other words, what? In the narrative, we have the hard journey, the trial moment in order to fulfill the callings that God has in our life, right? We also have what? We have angels appearing to shepherds. What's that? In other words, the most unlikely people ever. They never would have thought this is where the news would be heralded, <laughs> right? Shepherds, the stinky ones. 
is where the angels appear. That's in the story. What else do we remember? We remember, I'm going to call it divinity seekers. In other words, really wise people who study spiritual things, the wise men who were able to read some signs, who brought gifts to honor Jesus, and yet who really were they? They were people they didn't really understand who Jesus was or what was going on. They just were, they just were doing the best they could as, as like um, spiritual people. How about that? <laughs> And then we, and then I've just got one more. I have to put this in. We have Herod, right? What is that? Just for right now, I'm going to say the spirit of Herod <laughs> was very much alive. And what is that? Jesus is about to be born. And the thing is, is at the moment of his birth, there is already a spirit in the world that wants to kill the conception. Now, now why am I putting all that out there? Here's the thing. God is eternity, and I think one of the greatest limitations that keeps us from the transformational power, the, the, you know, not just a narrative, but something that can transform, is understanding that it's a revelation of an eternal father. In other words, what? What, has, what he has done, he's still doing, and he's always going to be doing. So... So the Christmas story, um, he is still, the Christmas story is happening in your life yearly, weekly, daily. <laughs> he's still, he's still with you in presence himself and sending his messengers to orchestrate impossible things for your participation in the kingdom. Like with Mary, Mary, he is still calling us to the hard road trip, those moments in life where you're like, man, this is the wrong time. You, you know, whatever that road trip is, that journey, that trial, you got to walk. That is part of the process of the release of the kingdom of God. The spirit of Herod <laughs> is still very much alive and it will be until all evil, all evil is finished finally and forevermore. Kingdom now, kingdom not yet, right? But um, the, the spirit of Herod is very much alive and not just in like a world sense. I want to say that the spirit of Herod is very much alive in your life. Whatever Christ births, the, it is, the, the enemy is there crouching at the door waiting to put to death what was conceived, what is birthed. Okay. You see, there's only transformation um, when we understand he is always doing this Christmas story. He's unchanging. Yes, it is a narrative at a point in time. But what it really is, is the revelation of your father. It's the revelation of his heart for, for you. It's Emmanuel, right? And, you know, we're, I'm pretty sure if we go according to plan, we're going to look at this. But, you know, Emmanuel was not like a new concept that happened on like the first Christmas morning or something when Jesus was born. God's desire to dwell and be among us always was the God among us, the God who lives in, with, and among, in front of you, and behind you, and all around you. That was always God's desire. Now, this morning, I, what's really on my heart is I just believe, um, you know, we're all thankful for Christmas and that, that Jesus was born. Are we thankful? I just think there is a depth that we can stop and look at that will actually increase our capacity to, to be thankful for who he is, what he did, what's happening there, the, the first Christmas and the Christmas that's like a daily thing. Um, and that's, that's where I want to go. And I want to start, you know, to do that, we have to stop and take a moment and realize we have to go about nine months before the first Christmas, okay? Because I'm going to put out there, and if somebody feels the need to yell out heresy or something, go ahead, I'm going to do it anyway. Um, I'm going to go ahead and say that that moment is... Is, was a more intense moment for the fellowship of the Trinity, for the communion of the Trinity, um, than facing the cross. 
And I, I'm going to show you why. And it's okay if you disagree. It's, they're, they're both awesome, right? <laughs> right? I mean, what's, what's more glorious than the actual payment for your redemption? So, so don't throw anything at me. I'm just going to go through some, I'm going to look at some things this morning where I think our capacity is going to be increased when we realize how intense the conception moment was. Like, what was that? So, so listen, to get started there, go with me to Philippians chapter 2. In your Bible, on your phone. <laughs> and I'm going to start reading verse um, in verse 5. Here it says, um, Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. In other words, that's his saying. Have the mind of Christ. We see that all over, right? Have this mind. Who, describing Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. Now, I'm going to read one, more than one translation this morning. This is one of those scriptures where go ahead and read all 38 translations there are out there and then pray a lot <laughs> and wait for the revelation. Because this saying, being in form, the original language is like being, being um, literally, exactly, being in form is like exactly, is, is God. Okay, and he didn't consider it robbery to be equal. We'll look at that in a second. Verse 7. But made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, so literally becoming, and coming in the likeness of men. This word likeness um, is like, um, it's a terrible translation. It's like um, the, the essence of, the nature, literally is man. Okay, it's when God, so in other words, when God literally became a man, okay, and then goes on in verse 8, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself, and listen to these words, and became obedient to the point of death, even death of the cross. So here, I'm going to toss this out. Here, we already have the concept that Jesus willingly accepted, he's God, don't forget that, he willingly accepted a life of obedience, even to death. Goes on, therefore, God has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess, confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So what happened? I'm going to read, um, read it again, just verses 6 through 8 from the Amplified, and we're going to do something with that. If you're not familiar, the Amplified Bible is like reading all 38 translations at the same time. <laughs> Sometimes I love the Amplified. It'll just clear everything up. So listen to these, wor listen to these words. Who, describing Jesus, although being essentially one, essentially so in nature, one with God and in the very form of God, possessing the fullness of the attributes which make God God, did not think this equality or oneness with God was a thing to be eagerly grasped or retained. But he stripped himself of all privileges and rightful dignity so as to assume the guise of a servant or a slave and that he became like men and was born a human being. And after he had appeared in human form, he abased and humbled himself still further and carried his obedience to the extreme of death, even the death of the cross. Now, look, here's the thing. Theologians, Christian theologians, let's narrow it down a little bit, <laughs> um, love to argue here. And I would say they would all stand up and say, God, Jesus was fully God and fully man. And they would go, yeah, we agree. And then when they start to talk about um, what that actually means, then they can, they can argue until it's nauseating, right? But let's just do this. Let's keep it simple. For sure, the Word of God tells us that the, at, the attributes of God, the very things that make God God, He laid down and ministered as a man filled with the Spirit. 
Now, I got to put this out there. That makes me so thankful. I heard, um, I always have this problem. I remember the quotes and I can't remember the who's. Like, I don't know if this was John Wesley or, or Finney or I don't remember who said this. But somebody said something to the effect of, um, they were so thankful that Jesus laid it all down and ministered as a man full of the Spirit because he became someone he could follow. And knowing that, what did he say? He said, if he ministered as God only, that would amaze me. And then he went on and said, but the fact that he ministered as a man filled with the Spirit makes me somehow terribly dissatisfied with my life. Because we're, we're, that's the call. We're to minister as men with the Spirit. And we have a standard. I didn't plan. That was a rabbit trail, Sim. <laughs> it was a good one? Good. I'm glad it worked out for you guys. <laughs> I'm going to put this in there. So, you know, in other words, I want to... Um, yeah, I want to... Make this really real for us now. Because I, am, I imagine that you have meditated on his birthday, like the manger and everything. You've, you've put yourself there. You've tried to experience, understand all of that part of the narrative. I want to look at a part of the narrative that um, I have a feeling it was kind of new for me to do this, and it, it might be for you. Do you realize there was a moment in the fellowship of the Trinity that... They had to make a decision for Jesus' conception. In other words, listen, what are we talking about? Um, I traveled recently, and so I was in airports, you know, wearing your mask for 13 hours straight. And I know many of you do it for work all the time. God bless you. And, and I saw the um, iconic moment that you see all the time. Um, or you might have seen it in a driveway, if not on the, at the airport. Um, there's a threshold when there's about to be a parting, right? So what do you call it, the, the concourse or the, the thing you walk down? What's that called? Jetway. The a jetway concourse. Yeah, there's a threshold there where you see that emotional moment, and it's not that we're never going to see each other again, or at least you're usually not thinking that. Um, and, but, but you're aware that the way that you're together, the fellowship, the communion that you have is about to be horribly changed for a while. And you see there, there's tears. You can, you can, I'm watching pain as the person crosses the threshold and walks down that little hallway to the plane. You, you've seen this moment in driveways before, but have you ever meditated on, there was a moment in heaven when the Father says, we need somebody to go. Can you, you know there had to be pain on the Father and the Spirit's face. They're, they're, they had a moment of pain together. Nine, nine months <laughs> before Christmas. And the Father's saying, will someone go? And Jesus said, I'll do it. I just, I invite you to sometime this Christmas season, just take some moments in your devotion time whenever and, and just ask him to give you a revelation. In fact, we'll probably do it before this service is over and then you can do it again like six more times and not get to the end of it. The, the fellowship of the Trinity had to let Jesus go into what? Into the vulnerability of, of a fetus. <laughs> how vulnerable is that? We're, we're in touch with that in this world. How vulnerable is the fetus? And then, to, and then to be, you know, he had to grow up. The scripture says it talks about his boyhood years. He, he grew in wisdom and stature, favor upon, among men. He, he had to do that thing. <laughs> he went uh, th through the shame and, and, um, and the ridicule. Even growing up, it's recorded that as he began his ministry, he was already being minimized by the people who should have been loving him best, misunderstood by those who watched him grow up. That vulnerability was chosen. But see, now, I think the thing is, we have to stop and go, um, why was that chosen? I mean, what was really going on? And again, you know, we're so good at this, we would say, well, he was, he was going to the cross to pay the price 
And you'd be right. That, that, that is the reason. But I think there's more. I think it's deeper. We have to look at something here. And, you know, I have to do this one. John 17, John chapter 17. I'm going to start. I'm just going to read the first five verses of this chapter because um, there's a chance that someone's thinking I'm stretching <laughs> the things that I'm saying. And, and I just, this verse just popped at me and I have to show you this. Now, let me give you context. This is much later. This is like after Jesus' birthday and stuff. This is when he is actually beginning to face the cross. So Jesus, there are only a few places where it's recorded that Jesus prays for himself, at least what's recorded. And this is one of those prayers. It says, Jesus spoke these words, lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that your son may also glorify you. Now just pause for a second. He's praying glorify your son. In other words, as very God, there is some glory that he laid down. The decision to willingly do that, that is so intense. I think it's more intense than the anticipation of the cross. I mean, he had everything. In other words, what are we, what are we reading? He had everything disinherited it, laid it down so that you could be brought into the inheritance with him. He had to re-inherit everything so that you could be part of it and share in the inheritance. But he had to lay all that down, that which makes God God. <laughs> okay, I'm going to keep reading. Um, verse 2. As you gave him authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. That's the Father giving to Jesus. We're going to see what that is in a minute. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you've sent. I have glorified you on earth. That's Jesus speaking of the Father. He's saying to the Father, I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you've given me to do. And now verse 5, the whole reason we're reading this. And now, O Father, glorify me together with yourself, listen, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. In other words, we have a king, we have a savior that had all the glory. And obviously laid it down. Now for what? For you. For us. Yeah, for the, for the people of God. Now I want to look at that. What is that? Um, whoops. See, that drives the tech team crazy when I punch my mic like that. <laughs> okay, I'm going to go... You have to bear with me. Just this morning before I started, I, I got completely rearranged on the order here. Surprise, right? <laughs> I'm reading. Okay. Which I should never do. I should never agree to that. Okay. Yeah, I'm skipping too fast. All right, here we go, like this. I want to, I, I feel really strongly within me that we need to put a fine point on why they would make that decision. Now, God is one, don't get me wrong, but he's also Trinity. So in community, they made that decision to come back and get you. And I'm going to show you something. Starting back um, as early as um, Deuteronomy, I'm reading chap chapter 4, verse 20. I'm just going to hit one verse here. It says, But the Lord has taken you, speaking of Israel, taken you and brought you out of the iron furnace and out of Egypt to be his people and inheritance as you are this day. I'm going to read one more. Let's go to Deuteronomy 32.9. And it says again, for the Lord's portion, that's an inheritance word for them, it says the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is the place of his inheritance. Now, now listen to how crazy this is. How could God need to inherit something? How could he have an inheritance? I'm going to tell you that the scriptures make very, very clear that you 
are his inheritance. Go ahead and be honored for a moment. There's one thing that he had to go back and get. <laughs> you are his inheritance. It was always, you see, at the fall, it was lost. We were lost, but it was lost to him. You see, when he gave dominion to man, when he created a creature that would be honored like you are, that would have the power of will, that would not be coerced or forced, but would be a creature that, would, that, that is able to love, to love by choice, he, something became able to be, to be snatched. <laughs> now, he never, lacked, he, he never lacked the ability or the plan to go back and get it. If you follow me. But you are his inheritance. Now, I'm going to tell you something. I think we're going to teach on this more in weeks coming up. But it's a mutual inheritance. You all know, is it a song lyric or what is it where we say, I am yours and he is mine? Okay? It's mutual inheritance. It is the, it is the inheritance. <laughs> okay? It's a mutual becoming back one together again. But it is mind-blowing if you stop and realize that he lost an inheritance and the, the Trinity had to have that conversation. They had to decide together where we need to go back and get our inheritance. What is ours? All those who would put their faith in him. Now, let's just get this out of the way. Theologians argue, there are many that are like the, aud the audacity of Gentile Christians that say they're the inheritance of God. It's obvious, in, even in these passages, in, Deuteron in Deuteronomy, it's obvious that his inheritance is his people Israel. The only problem is not to extend it to you sitting here this morning. You'd have to take a black marker <laughs> and go over all the scriptures that talk about you're grafted into Israel. Okay, so you are the chosen people now. You, you either are grafted into Israel or you're not in. <laughs> you're grafted into Jesus or you're not in. And so it's this moment that in time, nine months before Christmas, <laughs> where God had to decide he was coming back to get you. And to do that, it was the choice to be the vulnerability of a fetus <laughs> and then be born and then grow up and then be baptized and have the Spirit come upon and remain and be the first one to minister from a Spirit-filled life in total obedience to the Father, get completely filled in the fullness of the Spirit, releasing the, the revelation of the Father's heart, in other words, the kingdom of God, being released for the first time like that. <laughs> and so Christmas started, well, it started before nine months before the the birth, but at least this morning, let's say, let's say Christmas started nine months before, and they had to cross that threshold. I'm going to read Ephesians 1, starting verse 18. It says, I pray also that this is Paul praying for the church of Ephesus, okay? I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know three things now, the hope to which he's called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. I want to focus on the second one. Have you ever noticed those words? The riches of, what's he praying? He's praying that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. In other words, you need divine revelation to understand these next three things. It's only given by divine revelation. You might get it conceptually or something, but he's talking about, what does it say? The eyes of your heart may be enlightened. And, and let's focus on the second one. Be enlightened that you may know the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. What did that just say? <laughs> the riches of his inheritance in the saints. Do you know what that says? You are what makes him rich. 
how long should I pause? <laughs> there was no hallelujah or nothing. I'm like. <laughs> That's the father's heart. You are what makes him rich. He feels poor without you. <laughs> he feels like he doesn't have his inheritance without you. And so they decided to enter a journey of extraordinary pain <laughs> and trial and hardship. He laid down the divine attributes to come back and get the inheritance. You can just see the Father and the Spirit there. They, they all know the game plan. Although Jesus would, Jesus, the moment he became fetus, he was going to grow into this. The scriptures make it very clear. But the Father and Spirit have to, have to experience this moment in time, however that is for God, <laughs> when he would cross the threshold in order to go back and get what makes him rich, you. He considers himself poor without you. That's the Father's heart. That's Christmas. I love the stories of the angels appearing to shepherds and, and talking impossible things over Mary and everything. It's glorious, but it's like the Lord just put on my heart, go back, go back further. <laughs> there was a moment where we, in community, in perfect love relationship, decided to let, to let, to ask one of us to go, and that person said, Father, I'll go. I'll go get him. I'll go to all extents to go get him. And we read a scripture already this morning that said, to, to, the point, to the point of obedience all the way unto death. How can you grasp that? A God who had everything and, and disinherited it all the way to the point of, of abuse and torture and death. And then, and then he took what was yours, what, what would have been yours, and took it to hell and left it there. <laughs> He had to give up all the divine attribute and live as a man to make that happen because of the dominion of man in the earth. That was God's good plan. And he got you back. <laughs> you are the riches of God. You are what makes him wealthy according to him. <laughs> That's our father. That's our father. I am his and he is mine. It's a mutual Inheritance. <laughs> I'm shaking up here. Skip page. I'm supposed to go back. I wrote myself notes that said, then go back to this page and then skip over to this page. I should have just... <laughs> mm. mm -hmm. Okay. Skip to page four. No, you know what? I'm just going to do this. I want to read... Um, as long as we're right here, I want to read Hebrews chapter 4. I'm going to start in verse 14 because I have to tell you, just this is a, sort of like a side note, but it's well worth it. <laughs> here in verse 14, it says, Seeing then, speaking of Jesus as our priest, seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. In other words, the declaration of what we believe, okay? For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Now listen, let us therefore, I know you've heard this before, try to hear it again for the first time. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Apparently, the Father's heart, the perfect representation, the, the exact image, the exact representation in action in the flesh, apparently is that guy. <laughs> that guy who would say, I'll go, and would go through all the things that, that you go through. It had to be that guy. <laughs> Okay, now, here's the thing. If I, once I find the right page, <laughs> okay, let's, 
Let's do this. Father, help me. So the same spirit that, so, so Jesus was baptized and the spirit came upon and remained so that the attributes of God were restored. You got it? So that he could reveal the kingdom. <laughs> so that he could execute the Father's heart in this place. And he's still doing it in your life. And he's calling you to join in that. For the Spirit to come upon and remain. So that you can reveal the Father's heart. And execute the kingdom will in this place. Now, gather this. I'm going to read the scripture in a minute. But I want to tell you first. The same spirit who is your seal of everything we just talked about. In other words, the assurance, the, the stamp of it's, it's done, it cannot be taken away. He is the seal of these things. You also know that he's the same spirit, the, the word of God tells us, that makes us cry, Abba, Father. Okay, now why? Is it just like, well, there's, this is one thing about the Holy Spirit, and over here, this is another thing about the Holy Spirit. It's not that. I'm going to tell you it's the same thing, because, because listen to me. We, I think we're going to teach more on this, but just for this morning, I have to tell you. No, you know what? I'm going to tell you right now. I just cannot not tell you right now. We get stuff so wrong, um, and how about we correct the record? Do you know how inheritance works? Do you know you, you, you don't earn inheritance? You don't get inheritance because you did well enough to get it. You, um, you don't get inheritance because you prove that you're ready to handle it well. <laughs> Why do you get it? How does inheritance work? Why do you get inheritance? It's a gift. It's who we are. And, and who are you? Who gets inheritance? The sons and the daughters get the inheritance. The son doesn't get the inheritance because they've shown, well, I can handle this well, Daddy, if you give me the inheritance. There's only one reason you get the inheritance. It's because you're a son. It's because you're a daughter. Um, now, listen to me. We, and we see, we see that, um, let's just put this out there, in the, in the parable of the prodigal, right? Kid gets the inheritance. It has nothing to do, I think the father knows exactly what the son's going to do with it. And, and in, isn't it wonderful when we completely blow it, that he can restore the whole inheritance as if none was spent? Thank God for that. But now I've got to tell you this. The parable, let's do this too. The parable, um, what's, what would it be called? The workers in the vineyard? It also shows you that um, it's all the same. All the kids get all the inheritance. It doesn't matter if you came late, if you're late to the game. Or you screwed it up, you left for a while, and you come back, well, I wasn't late before, but now I'm late. <laughs> you still get it all. But here's what we really have to correct. And you know, I never really thought about this before. I, I just, I truly believe the Lord had me look at this and think about this this week. Um, what we do, we take a lot of Jesus' teachings and parables about inheritance I'm sorry, let me try that again. A lot of his teachings and parables that are not about inheritance, and we make it about inheritance, like the parable of the talents. That is not a teaching or a parable about inheritance. It is about stuff that we're given to steward. <laughs> okay? Why can I say that? Because nowhere in the word of God, it would not work out. Okay, nowhere in the word of God does it say that your inheritance can be diminished or increased based on how well you do with it. <laughs> Anybody thankful? Yeah. No alleluias anywhere? <laughs> because my inheritance might be about this big <laughs> half the time. Thank God for the heart of a father that does not base your inheritance on anything you do with your success or your failure in this life to let the spirit remain upon so you're revealing the father's heart. It just doesn't work that way. That is just, that is stuff <laughs> that you're given to steward. Now, church, is it important that we steward the stuff we're given well? Yeah, it's huge. Jesus is, it's so big, Jesus is teaching about it. <laughs> 
But our inheritance is settled. And how can that be true? Now, now listen to me. Inheritance, it's, it's, it just becomes crystal clear when you understand that your inheritance is him. And his inheritance is you. Now look, if, you, <laughs> if we get this wrong, you'd have to say that in order for your inheritance to be diminishable, you'd have to diminish him. And he cannot be diminished. His heart for you, his unfailing love that you're going to spend the rest of eternity not getting to the end of how much he loves you, cannot be diminished and will not be taken away from you. No matter what your performance. Need something to be thankful for this Christmas season? <laughs> Now, I want to I make sure I have time. I feel like the Lord wants us to have a ministry time this morning. So we're all together in person. I think this is Ephesians. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to begin um, just closing the teaching time here with some things. Um, now, I have to say... You all know that, um, and you may be one of them, okay, but the Christmas season is really hard for some people. Um, I just want to say, you know, um, it, it's filled with either painful things they're going through now or painful past things that happened in this season. Or, but let me just put out there, and, and viewers out there, listeners out there, to all of you, if Christmas has drops or bucketfuls of pain for you. You're in good company. <laughs> I don't think it was a rejoicing moment in the courts of heaven. I might be wrong. I think it was a hard, hard moment when Jesus crossed that threshold and said, I'll do it. I think angel jaws dropped open <laughs> all over the throne room and they were like, you're going to do what? And I think there was great pain, even, even in God himself. It was a painful moment. So I just want to put out there, first of all, you're in good company. But the seal, I never read the seal of the Spirit verse, did I? Why do you guys let me get away with that? <laughs> but that's okay, we'll leave that alone. You have the seal of the Spirit for the assurance of your promise. And I think that's what they were going on. <laughs> They knew that he was going to win. The Father in the power of the Spirit through Jesus in this place was going to win. And so they were willing to keep walking the journey of pain because it, it, resu it has already in your life and your hearts and is going to result. The Father wins. <laughs> the Father's love is, has and is going to win. And the Christmas story is, is unending. It's unraveling every day in your life. It's not just a narrative that happened back there. Now read with me in Ephesians. I'm pretty sure this is... Go ahead and correct me this time if, if it's wrong because my notes stink right here. I think it's Ephesians chapter 1. And I'm start, I know I'm starting in verse 7 of whatever chapter of the Bible this is. <laughs> Don't laugh at me. <laughs> Verse 7, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace, which he made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure. Whose pleasure? His. Which he purposed in himself that in the dispensation of the fullness of the times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth in him. How many times does it say in him in this passage? In him also we have obtained an inheritance. This is the mutual inheritance. I'm his, he is mine because he came back and got me. 
being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. Now listen, actually, oh, here, I'm reading it now. Verse 13, in him you also trusted. Go ahead and say, I trusted. I trusted, yeah, you did, or you wouldn't be here right now. After you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. So I just want to put this, I just have to close on that. It's almost a subject change, but I just have to close on that. If you have pain in this season, I'm going to pray for you in a moment, but I want to invite you, rest in the promise. You're sealed. Jesus walked in pain too. And for him to do it, he willingly, if you're out there and you don't know the Lord, this might be your Christmas. All you got to do is say yes to Jesus. This may be your Christmas. This may be your year to receive the gift and the seal and the promise of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> and then you're sealed. It's not a promise that your pain is going to end immediately <laughs> or that the trials are going to stop, but you are going to have an Emmanuel God with you who's going to give the, the purpose of the release of the kingdom. You're gonna sh you can share in his ministry, in the joy, in the midst of the pain. You can have the joy of sharing in the release of the kingdom in this place until what this scripture says, until he comes back and sets everything right and wipes away every last pain. You'll have God with you. And the Father's heart is after you. Nine months before the first Christmas, or someone there, I'm not sure when they held the committee meeting. <laughs> they made a hard decision to come back and get you. You just had to have to accept the gift. And so actually, church, just play with me right now. Um, Father, we thank you that that is your heart. And Jesus, we thank you for saying, I'll do it. And Holy Spirit, we thank you for, for, for filling and going through the pain and all the hard things Jesus did to make this possible. And we just pray for everyone out there who just said, Lord, I want that. And um, we ask that your Holy Spirit would join them right where they're at right now in the name of Jesus. We thank you that this is their Christmas to receive you and to be received into your heart, Father. And we want to give thanks because now we've just expanded our brothers and sisters that we get to spend eternity with. And so those of you that are out there, I just want to just say I can't wait to meet you. Sometime between now and the end of eternity, I know I'm going to run into you. <laughs> and that's going to be fun. Thank you, Jesus. Okay, um, with the worship team come on up and bring some of the atmosphere of heaven here for us. <laughs> you can start any time. And I had a, um, a pastor tell me recently, he's actually my pastor, um, tell me recently that um, communion, you know, we think of the Lord's Supper, and, um, and that's communion, um, but it's really the Lord's Supper. Communion is, um, it really just means with. <laughs> to be in deep fellowship with is what communion is. And we don't have communion elements this morning, but as I just kind of listened 
for the Lord there for, for a moment, what he wanted to do. I, I feel like he wants me to tell you. He wants to have communion right now with you. We don't have the bread and wine, and it's not, I, I love the sacraments, okay? And, and he, he asked us, in, even in obedience, he said, he said, do this, the sacraments of the bread and the wine. There's something about, about physical participation. I would never minimize that. But I believe, um, as I just listened for a moment, I believe he wants to have communion with you right now. And um, I think we should do like this. I think um, this may this may be the way that he meets so powerfully for some of you and, and others maybe not. So I want to put out there the freedom. If this doesn't connect deeply with you, um, that is okay. That There's nothing wrong with you. <laughs> and God's not withholding. We're all so unique. He has a unique relationship with all of us. But I think... Um, he wants to invite you to, to sit and experience. I didn't think of it as communion, but he wants you to experience that moment, <laughs> that parting moment when, when Jesus would come and, and disinherit everything so he could re-inherit everything, and this time you'd be a part of it. You'd be back in the inheritance. So, so here it is. I'm going to do better. Lord, help me get these words right. He wants to invite you to sit with them. The Trinity, the one God Trinity, sit with them and let them reveal that moment when that parting happened at the conception of Jesus. And you may get a picture, you may get a word, you may just get intense feelings and let him speak through it. Stay right where you're at. And I believe Jesus just wants you to receive these words. Receive this in the name of Jesus. He wants to tell you, you make me rich. you to know that you are his wealth.
Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Um, if you are here this morning and um, part of the reason that you're here or it just got put on your heart is you really need somebody to, you, not Nate, how about you want somebody to pray with you this morning? That would be a blessing. Will you just shoot up a hand? <laughs> okay. All right. If you're at home, would you? No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> Joe, would you check out there and make sure there's no one sitting in the overflow that shot up a hand all by themselves, maybe, <laughs> who needs prayer? I'm going to pray for you anyway. <laughs> yeah. Let me just pray a Christmas blessing. Father God, I pray a special blessing. You said, you said when we bless with our mouth, you, you fill it with the Spirit, and your blessing goes out from heaven. So I do that now. In the name of Jesus, I bless these here, those watching, those listening. I bless their families with all the blessing of your name, Jesus. May this season be filled with joy in the season when there's hardly any to find. There, there's no real joy in the world. There's hardly any happiness to find most places. <laughs> and yet your kingdom is joy. So in the name of Jesus, I bless with joy this Christmas season. May families experience joy that surpasses anything that makes sense in this world. In your name, Jesus. And we thank you. We want to thank you in advance for your presence, God with us, your presence in our families, in our celebrations, and even in the hard stuff yeah. some of us face yes. during these holidays. We love you more than anything, Jesus. Thanks for coming back for us. Amen. Amen.